So let's talk about this soil piece. So there was an article in a conservation journal that basically this author said, does humanity have to choose between fostering either human health or environmental protection, or can we accomplish both? What I would argue is that we can't accomplish either one without doing the other. We are an organism that is intricately tied to our environment, and if we do not support our environment, we simply cannot support our health. It's just not gonna happen. So then the question that everybody wants to know is, well then if we're gonna take better care of our soils, are those soils actually going to produce better food for us? And this is kind of a hard question to answer. So it is very clear that pasture-raised animals have a very different nutritional profile compared to conventionally raised animals. So this is one area where I do not make an exception. When you're talking about conventionally raised animals, the human and environmental impact of eating that type of meat is tremendous. Um, this is a major source of greenhouse gases, a major source of pollution, um, and then you're getting, the nutritional profile that you're getting is going to be higher in these pro-inflammatory fats rather than the, the alternative, these pasture-raised meats. This is going to be an anti-inflammatory profile. So this is one place where it is really worth putting your, your money. There have been periods of our life where we have not had the money to be able to buy this, and we have been vegetarian during those periods uh, because this is such an important piece to me. I feel like this is one of the biggest arguments going on right now, too, when it goes to diet, whether or not it's a meat-based diet or a vegetarian diet that is sustainable over our continued population growth. And so whatever choice you make, I do believe that it is 100% worth it to invest in pasture-raised meats. So what is less clear is whether or not fruits and vegetables that are grown using different practices, what type of nutritional profile those foods have. So I have heard people say for years that our soils are depleted, and when our soils are depleted, the fruits and vegetables are depleted, and this makes sense to me, but there's just not a lot of documented literature that actually states this. Um, so the USDA did have a study um, where the, you know, they're monitoring the nutritional value of fruits and vegetables as well. And there is a definite decline in the nutritional value of 43 different fruits and vegetables. This information coming from the USDA. What is not clear is why we have that nutritional decline. So there are lots of different hypotheses, but one of the hypotheses that's quite likely is that it's due to the fact that we are selecting varieties based on yield and uniformity, um, we're not selecting them for taste. We're selecting varieties that can successfully be shipped thousands of miles without being damaged. And so you're losing this taste piece. And oftentimes taste is going to be one of your primary indicators of the nutritional value of that food. So there is a documented decline in nutrition. Um, what's causing it, I can't say for sure. Um, so there is testing that's being done. The Rodale Institute, this is a nonprofit that has been doing uh, different types of farming trials for about 30 years now, and they just started, what's that? 50 years. 50 years, okay, 50 years. So she knows, ask her about Rodale. Um, <laughs> so they've been doing farming trials for about 50 years now, and um, one of the things that they've just started is their fruit and vegetable trial. So this has only been going on for about two years, but they are looking at different crop treatments and how that affects the, uh, the vitamin, mineral, protein, carbohydrate outcome for these different crops. They do have a little bit of preliminary data for butternut squash and oats, and they do see a little bit higher nutritional value for those organic foods. Um, I can't remember if it was statistically significant or not, but they are seeing a trend towards improved nutrition using organic methods. Uh, the Bionutrient Food Association, these guys are doing kind of this interesting thing where they want to develop a tool that you can um, you know, use spectrometry to shoot it at a plant and be able to tell, you know, it'll give you a reading of how nutritionally valuable that food is. Um, but in this research, what they're doing is they've had people shipping them spinach and carrots from all over the country and asking how they were grown and then trying to make that connection between growing methods and nutritional value. What they found is that there is a huge range of nutritional value in the spinach and, and carrot samples that they're getting, but it actually cannot be explained 
by the growing method. So they're, they're working this out. They're trying to figure out more information. Um, Gabe Brown, there's a kind of a buzzword around farming. Have you guys heard of regenerative farming? Is anyone? Um, so for years, you know, decades, what we were talking about is that we needed sustainable farming. We needed sustainable farming to be able to keep going for years and years and years. But the problem is that we've so heavily degraded our soils, what we need at this point is regenerative farming. We need something to regenerate the health of our soils. And regenerative farming is just based on uh, natural processes. It's using existing ecological processes that will build the health of your soil. Um, so Gabe Brown is kind of leading the forefront in regenerative agriculture, and they are going to start doing some testing on his farm to look at how his growing methods uh, affect the nutritional outcome for different foods. But what I kind of think about this is this is just another example of us breaking foods down into this ideology of nutritionism. We think about, you know, we're monitoring these plants for their fats, carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, minerals. We're not looking at the plant as a whole. So for me, when I am pulling these plants out of my garden, I can see, taste, and feel the difference. I don't necessarily need a test to be able to tell me that this is a more nutritious food. I mean, that'd be great simply because then I could get up in front of audiences and say, you know, hey, we have this great data that's saying this, these foods are nutritionally superior. Um, but it's hard to get that it's hard to get that data. So I think that you know, one of the things that's happening is that plants are in contact with the soil. And when you have this thriving population, this thriving microbial population below the ground, there are all of these compounds that are being released into the soil. Same thing that's going on in your gut. It's happening in the soil. Um, and plants can uptake different compounds. We know this because we use systemic insecticides, things that will spray in the soil that can, mo that can move through the plant. So, you know, they, they can uptake larger mo molecules than we initially thought. So one example of how this might be at work is a antioxidant and um, amino acid called ergothionine. Ergothionine is present in mushrooms, so a lot of the uh, gourmet mushrooms like shiitakes, and ergothionine has been associated with uh, longevity and a more graceful aging process. But you only find this in mushrooms because mushrooms are the only plant that, or not plant, excuse me, uh, they're the only food source that, she's laughing at me. <laughs> she's like, they're not plants. <laughs> um, but mushrooms are the only organism that is producing ergothionine. But they have found it in celery and a couple of other plants and what they have speculated is that it's the fungal networks that are below ground that are producing ergothionine that can then be absorbed by these plants and assimilated into their tissues. So we can't break this stuff down into all of its parts in order to get a solid answer is the way that I feel about it. I, I think that we, we have to think of things in this broader sense. We can't just keep breaking them down into these little parts and expecting to find the answers that we want. So I think that growing practices are a really important thing to look at. So then, if you could get this down to just five points, you know, what should you be eating when you're thinking about your health, the health of your microbiome, the health of the environment? You know, there's a lot of things to consider when you're thinking about what is a healthy diet. And the first thing I have listed is as close to the source as possible. So for starters, this means going to your local farms. Um, the other benefit to going to your farmer's market and your local farms is that you can ask them how they're growing their food. And for some people, they feel a little bit intimidated to ask these questions. What I've found is that farmers are excited to tell you about what they do. They are proud of the work that they are doing, and they are ready to describe their processes to you in length, if you will let them. And so getting as, sourced, as close to the source as possible. The other thing that I mean by this is that when you get a packaged processed food, the ingredients from that came from all over the place. So it's coming from, you know, you don't know where it came from. And then it's being shipped multiple times till it reaches a factory to where it is assimilated into whatever product it is that you're buying. And so this is getting pretty far from the source at this point. And so 
you can think of it as getting close to home, getting close to local, but then also getting as close to that real food as you possibly can. So this is that idea of shopping on the outskirts of the grocery stores, trying to find whole food ingredients. Um, and this is another reason that I wrote my book. This is also a meal planning and prep guide because in order to eat from scratch, you have to know how to cook. Um, and there, this could be for another talk, but there is a historical lineage that you can look at as to why it is that people aren't cooking anymore. So this is becoming a lost art, but this is something that is essential. It's essential to be able to feed yourself. I mean, that's the way I feel about it. Like, we should be able to cook, and some of us should be able to grow some portion of our food just as a responsibility to ourselves um, and being able to feed ourselves. So eating an abundance of fiber-rich foods. So if you are vegetarian, if you're meat-based, if you're paleo, if you're keto, I mean, you have a load of options these days. Whatever it is, those microbes that reside in your digestive tract, they need fiber. Um, they, they need all of this fiber in order to survive. And so I think that the one thing that most people can agree on is that eating as many fruits and vegetables as you possibly can can never be a bad thing. Um, so focusing on getting as many of these foods in your diet as possible, non-GMO and free of pesticides, it is debatable as to whether or not the proteins that are manufactured during the genetic modification process, whether or not these are harmful. But the problem, that the biggest problem I see with GMOs is that all that we have done with them is make it to where we're using more chemicals. So we have not solved the world's hunger problems by developing um, corn that can grow in the desert. That's not what we're doing. We're basically making it to where you can spray more glyphosate and that some of these plants can produce their own chemicals. So um, avoiding GMOs and pesticides, focusing on quality pasture-raised meats, and then focusing on healthy fats too. I do think that we are starting to slowly change our idea around fat, but that low fat craze, I mean, that is really ingrained in people's psyche. That is a hard one to get over after we did that for you know, two to three decades. And so now we're saying, oh, right, I guess we need fat. Right, our brain, it's mostly fat. We could use that. Um, so focusing on real food, I mean, that's, that's how you best support your, your health. And the last point that I want to leave you with is that food is medicine. This has been recognized for thousands of years. And foods have all of these different qualities that we can't necessarily identify, pinpoint, put a name on it. But when you're eating real whole foods, you're doing your body a service in a number of ways that you might not even recognize. And hopefully today this was an opportunity for you to explore more how it is that the microbiota are involved in that process and how it is that your food um, can impact those populations. So, so I appreciate you guys coming. So thank you very much. So now, um, do you guys want to do some questions? Is anybody anything they're dying to ask? I guess I covered it all. <laughs> yeah. So when you were talking about carbohydrates being good, you had that beautiful picture of the potatoes. You said white potatoes. Why white potatoes and not sweet potatoes and red potatoes and yellow potatoes? So for some reason, it's that white starchy center of the potato. So it could be a red potato. It could not be a sweet potato. A sweet potato is a, is a different thing. Um, I don't know the exact reason. All I know is that when you cook that white potato and it cools off, it has this, these uh, prebiotics in it. Um, but I mean, sweet potatoes are a form of, they have plenty of fiber in them. I mean, when you start to look at your carbohydrate options outside of grains, you're left with sweet potatoes, potatoes, carrots, beets, winter squash. Um, I mean, people seem to confuse a grain-free or a low-grain diet with it being low-carb, and that's not actually the case. Um, I'm still eating plenty of carbohydrates, and I'm still eating tons of fiber. I would actually argue I'm probably eating more fiber than most people um, just by focusing on that vegetable piece. The other interesting thing about grains is, um, so how many of you garden again? This is a question I always like to ask. Um, how many of you have ever grown grains? OK, so have you harvested them? Yeah, years ago we had a little plot. It was just an experiment. And then did you ever do it again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so I think that's one of the issues with grains is that it's a, this incredibly labor-intensive process. So 
Um, I use oats and buckwheat and some of these different foods for cover crops, and I have fed them to my chickens, but I had a pretty big area planted with oats this year, and I thought about harvesting them, but I thought, you know, I'm going to be out there for like an hour, and maybe I'll get a bowl of oatmeal. Um, and so this really is an extremely labor-intensive process. So when you're thinking about being able to access local foods and foods that you can grow in your own yard, you know, that's, that's another reason that I focus on things like sweet potatoes, potatoes, uh, winter squash, and some of these other forms. I mean, I'm still eating the sweet potatoes that I grew over the summer. Um, you know, I still have probably another month's worth of those left, and then I'll have to buy them somewhere else. Yeah. Um, how much are you selling your book for today? Um, it's normally 35, but how about we'll do 30 today? Does that sound good? And I'll even sign it if you, if you say please. <laughs> and your email address? My email address is leah, L-E-A-H, at deeprootedwellness.com. Um, so that is, I, I do a lot of work in the schools, and um, I do a lot of traveling for public speaking, and then I'm trying to write another book, and so and I'm also working on a side project that I'm not quite ready to announce at this point, but um, I do want to have some type of place where people can come and kind of learn a little bit more about food and cooking especially. Uh, what I have learned from working with kids is that their parents don't actually know these skills either. Um, so some of these really simple things that I've been doing with kids like cracking eggs and chopping broccoli are things that parents don't know how to do. And so um, when you're talking to them about health, how can you possibly expect them to take this step of gardening when they're not even quite sure what to do with a head of broccoli? Um, you know, but parents are busy. I mean, I get it. I, I understand why we've gotten here, but it doesn't mean that we can't find solutions to figure it out. Yeah? Have you ever permitted your water keeper? I have or not. Kefir, or kefir. I have not done that. Um, has anyone? Meredith may have done this. Yeah, there's actually some videos about it at Living Web Farms if you want to check that out. Um, and Patrick Battle, who's the director here, um, if you send me an email, I bet I can get you hooked up with some water cover grains if you're interested. I actually got some. I've been oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I've been doing it for quite a while. I'm just, I'm like really into it. It's cool. Just, it's got to make some neat um, fizzy drinks and stuff. You can nice. flavor it up with all kinds of cool stuff. It's supposed to be very probiotic. But I'm still learning about it. You can, you gotta adjust it just right. Okay. <laughs> I'm a lazy fermenter. I kind of, I ferment whatever is in excess for my garden. So I actually um, have a ready supply of fermented radishes um, because anybody who grows daikons knows that you probably shouldn't plant 40 of them, which is what I end up doing every year. So <laughs> we eat a lot of fermented radishes in my house. Yeah. When you're buying seeds for your garden, where, what do you normally get, or where do you get them? So I get them from a variety of places. Um, I'm getting them from Baker's Seeds, um, a company called Turtle Tree. That's uh, I really like Turtle Tree. Turtle Tree is based out of New York, and it's at a at Camp Hill Facilities, which is a working farm for mentally handicapped adults. My uh, younger sister lives there. So I do like to support what they have going on. They have a really incredible working farm, um, you know, hundreds of acres. And um, so it's a cool, it's, it's a good organization to be supporting as well. Um, I also get some from So True. Um, you know, at some of the conferences that I go to, I end up picking up seeds then. Um, Pitch Pine Farms just gave me some seeds. I, really, I get them all over the place. I'm not great at saving seeds. I think that I, um, I have a seed catalog addiction. So <laughs> getting those catalogs and being able to flip through them is really nice. Any other questions? All right, well, I hope you, did you guys feel like you learned something? OK, well, I appreciate you coming. And um, if anybody wants to buy a book, I will hang out afterwards and um, sign that for you and, um, yeah, give you any other information that you want. All right, well, thanks, guys. <laughs>